So welcome uh, this evening, um, everyone, and particularly um, Dr. Gavin Ashenden. We're very grateful for him to be here to support the devotional life of our parish, particularly our uh, feed and encourage our devotion uh, to the Eucharist, where there's already a great uh, culture of adoration uh, here in this parish. And um, thinking about Gavin Ashenden coming today, I was thinking my granddad would be very happy from above seeing me introducing uh, Dr. Uh, Gavin Ashenden today. My granddad, who was first a very proud Catholic and also a very proud Englishman from Lancashire, would enjoy the fact that his grandson is leading prayer before uh, an ex-chaplain of the Queen uh, comes to speak. And being in St. Augustine of Canterbury, no doubt, he also is quite happy here to see uh, Gavin Ashenden here today. St. Augustine, who came to vitalise and evangelise England, uh, would be very glad to see any convert. Um, and so today we have a convert who was a bishop in the Anglican Church. Uh, so let's carry on praying, uh, and we can pray that the king can also join the ranks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of uh, the one true church here uh, that we are uh, very proud and honoured to be a member of. So let us uh, start with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We give thanks for the greatest gift Christ has left us, himself truly present in the Eucharist. We ask for the grace and openness to the Holy Spirit that we may increase our knowledge and our devotion to the Eucharist. May we treasure the Eucharist, Christ himself, with that devotion of Our Lady. And we ask her to pray for us, interceding for us as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, grace the Lord, Lord is with, with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and, and blessed is the, the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Amen. Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Now I'll pass it over to Mike, who initially uh, thought it was great to bring the work of Carlos Coutas to this parish, and then a number of other options have opened up to him, so Mike will then introduce Dr. Gavin to us. Thank you, Father John. That was very kind of you. Um, before I start, I'm just going to tell you a little story which I think is appropriate to any gathering these days and it was on a church notice and it was sent to me by a friend and it said if you're entering this church to speak to God please turn off your mobile it's unlikely he will phone you on your mobile <laughs> and then it went further and said if you want to see God text him when you're next driving so <laughs> Don't, but just turn off your mobiles. Anyway, right. Um, as Father John just said, uh, we are very privileged here in Tunbridge Wells to have this wonderful exhibition. And although he said I was introduced it, it was, uh, somehow it's just come from somewhere. And I fell over Carlo, Carlo and I've got used to him, and I've been very intrigued in his life and everything else. And I went to Father Graziano and said, what about this? And once we finished with it, how about passing it on to other people? And he was being very, very supportive. So I'm very pleased about that. Unfortunately, he made a mess of the date tonight, and he's on retreat today. So he's sorry, but he's probably hearing this somewhere. So um, more to the point, um, the exhibition is there. Uh, it, it's here for a month. It's there to make the point to people again about the Eucharist, which so sadly seems to be disappearing from people's lives. So it's there, and Carlo has made that. And the day we put this up, it was suddenly announced um, that, that he, he was going to be canonized. And we thought, good heavens, how extraordinary. And then the next thing, I was putting up the banner outside, and I got a, a text from somebody saying, would you like a relic of Carlo? And the next thing we have, so we have the relic of Carlo coming to the church at the end of the month, on the 29th and 30th. So something <coughs> extraordinary has happened. And then Father Graziano said, well, we need somebody to speak. Who are you going to get? <laughs> and I said, well, I haven't a clue. Um, and I, I knew of Gavin, of course. And I thought, well, I'll never get, never get him to come to Tunbridge Wells. 
And I texted him and said, you know, could you be kind enough? And I introduced myself. And he said, I'd be delighted. So there we are. We have him with us. And I'm absolutely pleased about that. Very, very briefly, and I'm not going to give you his CV and synopsis. His life story is extraordinary. Um, he, he grew up in, in, in the southeast of England, but he, he lives in other places now. Um, but he graduated from um, Bristol University with a theology degree. Uh, a law he, degree. A law degree. A I beg your pardon. The theology degree was a bit later, wasn't it? He's got so many degrees, I can't keep up with this, you know. <laughs> I worked very hard for that law degree. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, he became a student in the Anglican... Yes. And, and was ordained in 1980, is it? Yes. 1980. Yes. Well, so pseudo, we, pseudo ordained in 1980. Pseudo. Oh, right. Well, I'll leave you to talk that one through. Um, he even smuggled Bibles into Russia at one stage, so he's had that. He became a bishop in the Church of England, of course, as we no, all... No, no, the Episcopal Church. Oh, church. What, what, oh. No, listen. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. The, the, the Church of England will be terribly upset if you said that. We, <laughs> we'll, we'll get letters of complaint. This is where we go so wrong, don't we? I'm sure, I'm sure... The first time God. I've heckled myself before I began to speak. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sit down in a minute. I'm sure God must be scratching his head up there. I think, oh, God, there's heavens above. What's it doing? Anyway, I'm going to leave it to him to do all that. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Anyway, Gavin, I, I know you're going to tell us all about it. And it's so pertinent because a lot of his own movement into the Catholic Church was through Eucharistic miracles. So yes. I'm going to leave yes. you at that. <laughs> Michael, I'm so sorry to contradict you, but the church would have a fit if you, if you made claims for their... For their... Yeah, the, well, well, we'll get on to that shortly. <laughs> well, it's really wonderful to be here, and I'm, I'm quite close to home. My own family comes from near Tenterden, where we were Romney Marsh smugglers. And, um, uh, and I think almost certainly, probably early uh, ultra-Protestants um, uh, from, from looking at the, the map in terms of what, what went on in the late 1400s. But um, I'm here not just because I love Kent and it's quite close to where my family come from uh, and because I've had lots of friends in Tunbridge Wells. I've even preached to some of the Anglican churches to no good effect over the years. So, but I'm here really because of the Eucharistic miracles because they're what brought me in. And so what I want to do to, today is to talk to you a little bit about them because it's, it's to my great surprise... Um, there are a lot of Catholics who don't know about them, let, let alone people outside the church. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm one of the worst kind of converts. I'm deeply passionate about being a Catholic, and I'm, worried, I'm sorry it took me so long. And you're, there are lots of people who are really quite critical, both of my enthusiasm and of my ignorance, and say, you know, he's only been a Catholic sort of the, from the day before yesterday. What does he know? And I say, well, not a lot, but I believe in the Mass, which is more than some of you do. Let me... <laughs> Let me, let me go to that for a moment in case you think that's rhetorical. One of the reasons for being here is that, is that Pew Research, who are a very competent group of people, have done some research in America, lots of good and bad things in America, but there are lots of Catholics there. In fact, my, my, the team that I'm part of, Catholic Unscripted, we go to talk in Chicago sometimes, and, and, and the churches and the Catholic renewal in Chicago are, are deeply impressive. But Pew Research says that 70% of American Catholics don't believe anything happens in the Mass. It's a big number. I mean, that's just huge. I don't know what it's like over here, but I wouldn't be surprised, given the demoralization of the church and the huge onslaught of culture, if the number isn't, well, you know, maybe, maybe half that. But even, even half that would be, would be huge. And so one of the reasons I'm here is when I discovered that the Mass really was the Mass, and that all the arguments that I had known historically about transubstantiation and 14th century scholasticism and Aquinas' penchant for Aristotle and all, all those clever but semi-relevant things uh, were, were essentially secondary because what really happened was that there was a miracle every time the Mass was celebrated. And this is such an extraordinary thing. It's really quite hard to get one's head around. And a number of things make it harder. One of the things that makes it harder is the enlightenment atmosphere we're in, where, where, if you like, matter and spirit have very little to do with each other, nature and the supernatural. This is part of what's happened to our, our culture. People are very suspicious of miracles. The very exciting thing about being a Catholic, which I, I get a frisson about almost every day when I wake up, is it's a, 
it is, it is the, the Christianity of miracles par excellence. I mean, they just never stop happening. And the whole, you know, the idea there's a relic coming here is deeply exciting. And I tease my evangelical friends about relics, starting with St. Paul's handkerchief and going on from there. The reason I'm here, I think, is partly because of the miracle at Buenos Aires. Now, I've no idea how many of you know about the Eucharistic miracles, but if you look at that exhibition at the back, you'll be astonished at how many there are and how well documented there are. And I think what Carlos Acutis was doing uh, in his love and experience of God was reminding the church, if you like, of almost our best kept secret. I went on GB News the other day to talk about him. They phoned me up occasionally uh, and, and allow me to speak. And the presenters were just, you know, your normal uh, uh, skeptical people. And they, they said, you know, what, what, tell us a bit about Carlos and the fact that he's becoming beatified. And I, I explained that, you know, they, all, they want to hear about the sneakers and the jeans and dying young and, and, and his passion for Jesus and you know, his notion that if people had any idea that this miracle of the Mass took place, they would flock into churches rather than rock concerts and sporting events because they would just be completely blown away by something bigger and better. But they don't know. And so one of his legacies to us is what you see on the back wall. I mean, he's not only an extraordinary example and saint and life uh, and intercessor, but what he said to the church was, you, you, you need the Eucharistic miracles, and there they are. And one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be here is because that's exactly my view too. People have no idea. So I, I said he was very excited about the Eucharistic miracles, the fact that science proves the Mass is real. And the interviewers on the end said, they looked at me gormlessly and said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, science has proved that, that, that transubstantiation works. And they said, that can't be true. I said, no, but it is true. There's a laboratory in New York where they took a bleeding host from Buenos Aires and they, they examined it. And the, and the scientist who did the examination was very upset because he accused them of being grave robbers or the equivalent. What are you doing bringing me tissue that is only recently deceased and has white blood cells that were not only, not only were they alive very shortly a while ago, but they appear to almost certainly come from a human heart that was placed under un, 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 unbearable stress. Where did you get this from? And they said, well, it comes from a host that was dropped on the floor about four years ago in Buenos Aires. And after being put in a cup of water, which is what we do with hosts that are treated carelessly, it began, it began to bleed. So we, we left it alone. We put it away and ignored it, hoping it would go away for a bit. And it hasn't gone away. It's still there and it's still bleeding. And we brought it to you to, to ask you to tell us what this is because it looks like rusty water. And he said, well, it, it's, it's human tissue. So I said this to the, uh, to, the, to the presenters on the news, and they said, yeah, well, that was, you know, that was a category area. You have to, this has to be falsified. This has to happen more than once, you know. The tests have got to take place more than once. I said, yes, they have. They've taken place another six times. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Mexico. There's been lots of these. And actually, not just lots since 94, which have been taken the same kind of test, but they've been lots through history. So, and, and they looked at me like I was telling them lies. They couldn't, they literally couldn't get their heads around it. And, um, and the female presenter said to the male presenter, you know, you've got to have fresh thoughts. And I think that's what we're here to tell the world at the moment. You, you need to have some fresh thoughts about the way you understand science and religion and miracles and, and nature. Because this goes back a very, a very long way. And part of my own journey is that, that I was very badly propagandized. I didn't know I was propagandized. I had a very expensive education. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, on top of my expensive education, I've got four degrees. So I'm, I'm as reasonably well educated as you can get without bankrupting yourself completely. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it didn't do me much good at all because I discovered that the things they've taught me are propaganda. And, and I've made myself very unpleasant because I've, I've been rereading the history of the 16th century, but from a Catholic point of view. Whereas I was taught, always taught it from a very reasonable, sophisticated, urbane Anglican point of view. And I've discovered it was all nonsense, and I was being misled. So I stood up amongst my friends and said, we were misled. And they said, no, you're just a passionate fundamentalist Catholic. We're not paying any attention to you. And I said, no, no, we were. You see, because once, once you discover what the Mass is, if the Mass really is the Mass, 
then a whole load of things follow from it. I mean, I'm going to give you an example of another Eucharistic miracle, just because I, I've came, come across it in the last few days. So it's not a bleeding host, but it's, a diff, but it's still a Eucharistic miracle. And I, I thought I'd, I'd read it to you, because it's such fun. I'm just loving this book. So this is a man called Carlos Aya. And Aya, he's famous for a thicker book, about four times as thick, called Reformations. And it's a very, very, uh, this is part of my rereading my, my history. And he's a Catholic intellectual a professor at Yale. One of the, this is another lecture, so I, I better not go down, too far down the road. But, 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 but one of the things he, he suggests is that Luther and Zwingli and Calvin were not really addressing theological issues. They were addressing, well, Luther, he thinks, was essentially addressing a, a psychological issue that he then dressed up as a, as a theological one. And, and Calvin and Zwingli were addressing political and philosophical ones. And this really wasn't just, as we've always, we're always taught, a battle about the Bible and a battle about concepts and the theology and the church. Of course, it was all set within the context of a Catholic church that needed renewing, but it always needs renewing. Every century it needs renewing. And, and to the disappointment of Protestants, every century it gets renewed. And it gets renewed by people like Carlos Acritas, a, a teenager in sneakers, because God has a sense of humor and a sense of the ridiculous, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and it, it, we, you know, we don't need a reformation or even, as Steve Ray calls it, a, de, a deformation. But I just thought I'd, I'd read to you from another book that, that Carlos Ayer has written, so I found my way back, thank God, is this History of the Impossible. It's called They Flew. Now, at first sight, I find this deeply unappealing. There are some, there are some miracles I really don't want to know about. It's a bit like hearing sort of about you know, you know, people's private neuroses. I'll love you as you are. You don't need to tell me. And, and, but this is about levitation. I don't need to know about levitation. I'm not interested at all. Uh, oh, and bilocation, which is slightly more interesting. Uh, have you heard of Maria Agreda? Oh, you're in for a treat. <laughs> well, she was, so she was a Carmelite nun who evangelized a whole tribe of Mexican Indians from Spain by bilocating. Now, you're going to say, this is nonsense. This is the worst kind of hagiographical exaggeration. It can't possibly be true, which I have to tell you is what the Inquisition thought as well. But the evidence is really quite problematic because she says she did certain things and then the people on the mission stations in Mexico said she did certain things there and the Indians said she did certain things. So who's lying? Um, but what we do know is that lots of Mexican Indians kept on turning up saying the lady in blue tells, has told us about Jesus and we've got to be baptized. What lady in blue? What does she... Well, there was no internet then. They couldn't Zoom. So letters took a few years. But eventually they, they crossed. Anyway, so there's quite a lot about Mary Agreda. But I want to tell you just briefly about St. Joseph Cupertino. It had to be a Cupertino, didn't it? I mean, just think of it for a moment. If you, want, if you want a contemporary saint to stick two fingers up at the technological establishment, what name would you give him if, you know, if he was not Silicon Valley? Cupertino will do very nicely. So here's St. Joseph Cupertino, and I don't believe a word of this, except that, except that Carlos Ayer has, done, has got hold of scores and scores of contemporary documentary verification. Oodles and oodles of it. And there's even, a, there's even a moment, so what, what St. Joseph, we'll get onto the Eucharistic miracle in a moment, but his great forte was levitation. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, what they say what they was that he was obviously a well-trained gymnast, <laughs> very good at doing backward leaps, quite some, some, you know, what else would you say if you didn't believe in miracles? So <laughs> let me read to you what, what happened. Now, if you've heard of Leibniz, well, Leibniz was a very famous Enlightenment intellectual. And, and the, the, the secondary hero of this story is a Lutheran duke called Johann Friedrich. And Johann Friedrich employed Leibniz, who was one of the cleverest men in the 17th century. That's all you need to know about him. Say Leibniz in, in a university campus and people look solemn and say, oh yes. And so, so Johann Friedrich employed this man because he, he liked intellectuals of a substantial caliber. So the reason for telling you that is he's no numpty. He's no gullible, uneducated, unlettered, Bavarian, drinking, boar-chasing idiot. He's a very sophisticated 
man, and actually he's one of the ancestors of our royal family, and he was a, one of the most important Lutherans in, in, in Germany. So, um, and this, is, this is just so well, I so love this, I can't, I love being a Catholic. There's nothing, there's nothing like this in Method. I mean, Wesley is lovely, but, um, so, so, have you got a moment? Because, well, this, so the first people come uh, to see this man, because what happens is, he gets triggered. You all know what being triggered is like, we brought the, so if you would say Jesus to him, or Mary, or the Mass, he just goes up in the air, and up, and up. Now, I'm not asking you to believe that. I told you I don't believe it, except that I believe the documentation, and Carlos Eiser is an absolutely methodical historian, and that's why he wrote this book. Uh, we'll come back to the Eucharistic miracles shortly, but I just want to take you there via, via this, so you know that this isn't some kind of speciality in a corner for, for enthusiasts about liturgy and the Mass. This is about the whole Catholic life, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. And this is what it looked like in 17th century Italy. So, um, uh, you, had a, you had a bunch of people who came to meet him. Let's, so, one of the first people who visited Joseph in 1645 was Juan Alfonso El Reca de Cabrera, the most powerful Spaniard in Italy. Uh, and he, he brought a whole load of women and ladies in waiting with him just to get on with this very quickly. Um, and uh, suddenly, um, St. Joseph Cupertino came into the room. Uh, he never uttered a word, but as soon as he came into the huge church through the side door, he shrieked and he flew 12 feet, 12 feet above the heads of his illustrious visitors, hovered for a while in ecstasy before an image of the Virgin Mary, shrieked again and flew back to his takeoff point near the door and then returned to his cell silently. His head bowed, his face hidden from view by the cow. Apparently, the, Duke, the Count Duke Viceroy's wife and all the ladies in the retinue fainted and they fell on the floor. And the Count Duke Vice, Viceroy simply stood still in a stupor with his arms spread wide, bereft of all feeling, somewhere between life and death. Meanwhile, the Viceroy's wife had to be revived with smelling salts and a generous amount of holy water sprinkled on her face. I like that so much. Now, dramatic, that's just the, that's the aperitif. Dramatic as this levitation was, it paled into comparison to the one witnessed by the Lutheran Duke Johann Friedrich, 1625 to 1679, ruler of branch lundberg who converted to Catholicism after meeting St. Joseph, who is, who is called, for those who like sun headlines, the Flying Friar. This event, which merits closer examination in a later chapter, is one of the most symbolically charged of Joseph's miracles, which is going to bring us to the Eucharist, as you'll see. Johann Friedrich was a descendant of the Sacrum Princes who championed Martin Luther's Reformation. He was brother-in-law of King Frederick III of Denmark, and so an ancestor of the present royal family of England. And whilst on a tour of European courts with two noble companions, this Lutheran duke stopped at Assisi in 1649, where St. Joseph was, so he could visit the famous friar he'd heard about in Germany. Taken to the chapel where Joseph was saying mass secretly through a side door without Joseph being informed of his presence, that's important, you'll see why, the prince and his companions immediately experienced something very odd. As St. Joseph was consecrating the Eucharist at mass, he found it impossible to break the host at the moment of fraction. As required at that moment, staring at the host, he gave a tearful wail and a very loud shriek. He was given to shrieking quite a lot, but yeah, there we are. We all have our, our funny bits. And he flew about five paces backwards in the air in a kneeling posture in the air and then down to the altar again. I'm not asking you to believe this. I'm just telling you what people wrote and given, you know, and that, that lots of people wrote about it. Then after floating back down to the ground, and Teresa of Avila did a lot of this, you know, and in fact, Teresa of Avila said to her nuns, the moment you see me going up, grab me. As soon as you see daylight beneath my heels, hold on tight. I don't need any of this, she said. I, don't need, I neither need it nor want it. Keep me on the floor. And St. John of the Cross, <laughs> she and John of the Cross together were seen up in the air somewhere. It's documented. I don't ask you to believe it for a second. I'm just telling you what the what eyewitnesses said. So he applied, he came back down to the ground and remaining ecstatic for several minutes, he applied all his strength to the sacred host and finally broke it. 
The Saxon duke was, adept, was also astonished, but puzzled by Joseph's weeping and his struggle, his physical struggle at the altar. So he asked the father superior to question Joseph about it. When asked, Joseph replied that the visitors who came into the chapel in the middle of the mass must have been heretics with hard hearts, because only under such circumstances does the host become too hard to break. Think about it. Well, then Johann Friedrich goes to talk to, to, to St. Joseph, and they talk for a long time, and Johann Friedrich becomes a Catholic, and there's a huge scandal in Germany because he's such a formidably important Lutheran. And then, then everyone tries to get St. Joseph Cupertino hidden away because the monks can't get on with their regular life because the tourists will want to come and see him up in the air. Wouldn't you? I'd go like a ticket. I mean, you know, instantly to get a ticket to that. So the reason for telling you that is, first of all, this is a really well, a wonderful book, <laughs> and it's, it's just a sheer delight. Secondly, it, 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 it reconfigures the mind and the imagination. And again, if you want, look him up. The great thing about authors on is you can see the color of their eyes on YouTube and decide whether or not they're serious people. And Carlos Ayer is a very serious professor of history at Yale. And, and he's writing about this stuff because it's intellectually and culturally unacceptable and inexplicable. And if you tell news presenters, they won't believe you because effectively they're fundamentalists and they've been propagandized, um, as I had. So, let me come back to, to my own story a little bit, which is that um, I remember one of the important triggers for becoming a Catholic was when I walked into Westminster Cathedral one day. Whenever I went to London, I would go there to say my prayers because you can feel the Lord's presence there in a way you can feel his, his absence at St. Paul's and at what's left over of Westminster Abbey. And I'm not joking, I'm just saying it's really quite hard. I mean, there are bits of Westminster Abbey like the tomb of Edward the Confessor, where, where the air gets a bit thicker and you begin to think they haven't managed to get rid of God completely in this place, so they, gosh, they've tried. Um, so there I was in Westminster Cathedral and I, I, I nearly fell over um, one of the Catholic martyrs, um, a priest called St. John Southern. And, um, and uh, I, I didn't know really much, I began to read about him and then I began to read about all the Catholic martyrs uh, and, and I was surprised at, at the way in which the establishment seemed to have only had one real intention. And it didn't want to be invaded by Spain. It didn't like Spain. It didn't like the Armada, that there wasn't anything to do with stopping the Armada. And there were places following the pilgrimage of grace where people were very restive of the nationalization of, of every religious establishment. Uh, there was a great deal of unhappiness. And Eamon Duffy's wonderful but huge book, Stripping of the Altars, gives you an idea of quite how Catholic England was. Um, and there, there are complications comparing Mary's burnings to Elizabeth's Stasi state. But the thing about the Elizabethan Stasi state was it, it, it almost seems that its major aim was to stop the mass being celebrated. So the priests who came across from Dawe were, were just good Catholics who became priests and were ordained. And they, they brought with them a kind of disclaimer which says, I love Elizabeth. I love the royal family, I love the Tudors, I mean no political uh, dissension, I'm just here to say my prayers and to celebrate Mass. I'd like to go about my business quietly, please. And the response of the Anglican state was to arrest them and to torture them and to disembowel them publicly and to hang them at Tyburn pour encourager les autres. And it simply went on doing it for the, for the whole reign with a degree of viciousness and bloodthirstiness that's actually almost quite hard to believe. And then you get the feeling that although they were saying that this is about foreign policy and state security, you begin to get the feeling that what they really didn't want was Catholicism. They outlawed rosary beads. Well, why would you bother to do that? They hated the Rirodos where John and Mary stand at the foot of the cross. First thing they did in the Edwardian after Edward VI was to tear them all down and get rid of them. Then, fortunately, our late Mary came and they went rushing round all of Europe getting them back. Then Elizabeth came and they threw them all out again. I mean, there was, they were terrified of the symbolism of the Catholic Church, but most of all, they were terrified of the Mass. And I was brought up to believe that, that Elizabeth and the Anglican settlement was 
was the epitome of a, of a sophisticated inclusiveness, where Elizabeth swore that she didn't look, make windows into men's souls. No, she simply made holes in priests' stomachs and disemboweled them. Um, of course she made windows into men's souls uh, and executed them if, she, if the state didn't like what it found. And Cecil, father and son, ran, ran a state security service, and I'm not exaggerating, that would make, that would make Stalin's Russia look amateur. They were very, very efficient. Why? You have to ask yourself why. And so Robert Bellamine says that wherever you see people making an effort to stop the mass, this is, well, he used, he used words like this is a kind of foretaste of the Antichrist. I don't want to get apocalyptic because it, I doesn't, you know, I'm not very good at apocalypticism. But, but, there's a, but essentially what he's really saying is this is not just what it looks like. It has a very serious theological, spiritual underbelly to it. And so suddenly, what, if, you look at, if you look at English history from a Catholic point of view, for about 250 years, they worked extremely hard either to suppress the mass ever happening uh, and to keep Catholics anywhere from any influence in society at all. And you know how much they used to find them. If you didn't go to your local Anglican parish church on a Sunday, what's the average salary now for a teacher? About £30,000? You'd, you'd be fined a year's salary. £30,000 for not going to matins on a Sunday in the first Sunday of Lent. If you didn't go the next Sunday, they'd find you another £30,000. And the one after that, another £30,000. That was just for not going to the Anglican church. And so if you like, you had two kinds of Catholics. You had, you had those who complied because they couldn't afford the fines. And you had those who didn't comply, who built priest holes and paid enormous sums to the state. The state did very well out of the Catholic Church. The, the, I mean, even today, if you, if you want to talk about reparation, then consider reparation for the monastic houses, which, which was given to the friends of the royal family and kept until today. Catholic lands, Catholic money, Catholic houses. You could get quite excited about this. I almost feel like spilling tomato soup over a painting somewhere. But, <laughs> but, but when, you, when you think about it, let's get back to the mass. They wanted to stop the mass happening. Now, if the Mass is what, what it appears to be, for example, in the experience of St. Joseph Cupertino, or, or any of the... You've got, you've got the leaflet. Do read the leaflet. It's very exciting because it gives you... It, it's, it's so well written, this. Such, you know, let me, I mean, let me give you an example. Lanciano, 750 AD. This was a Eucharistic miracle that Carlo stumbled upon when he was 11 in 2002. He was amazed. Nobody had really told him uh, about them. Professor Linoli conducted scientific tests on the Laziano miracle in the 1970s. Amongst other findings, he reported the sample was blood type AB, it's always blood type AB, and that the tissue was from muscle in the heart. It's always tissue from muscle in the heart. Incredulous, the World Health Organization asked permission to conduct the tests themselves by my GP presenters. They didn't believe it. Their exhaustive tests confirmed all his results. Let's go on to Buenos Aires. Because the thing is, when I got interested in Catholicism, I didn't really want to go back to Laziano. I was more interested in things that happened in my own lifetime. So I started, for example, with Our Lady. I had a very nasty experience with the devil, which was awkward for me, because at the time I'd given up believing in the devil. And um, so I, I phoned a friend of mine who was a Catholic exorcist of the Diocese of Leeds and said, I, I think I'm having a very serious nervous breakdown. And he said, no, tell me about it. And I told him. He said, no, it's, it's, it's demonic and you need to pray the rosary. And I said, well, I'm quite well read in 14th, 15th, 16th century feminine Catholic mysticism, but I don't actually pray the rosary. And I remember him, he was wonderful. He said, oh, well, lad, he said, looks like, because he was from Leeds, looks like, I'm, sorry, I'm very sorry, really. nobody here will understand your correct, so I'm on, I'm on safe ground. Looks like you've got to make a choice, lad, he said, between being in hell or learning to love Our Lady and pray the rosary. What's it going to be? So I thought about it for a while. And, well, you can imagine what I decided. So I began to pray the rosary and hell began to diminish and the demons got back in the box. But I thought I'd better find out about Our Lady. So I decided I'd look at Garabondal because I was nine. And then I thought, well, if this thing happened when I was nine, it's my, I know it's northern Spain, but you know, they were nine too. So I bet there's some video around here. And um, I was sitting in my academic office and... Uh, watching 
the rather grainy video, which unfortunately someone's added some gothic music to, which doesn't help at all. And, and the girls were being taught to pray the rosary and cross themselves by Our Lady. You don't see Our Lady. But extraordinarily, the girls who can't see each other there are, are in, in perfect synchronization, so something's keeping them together. And a friend of mine who is a, a postgraduate psychologist wandered in, and she said, what are you looking at? And I said, well, purportedly, I'm looking at girls having an experience of our, of our Lady, but nobody can see apart from them. And it's, frankly, all, it's all a bit odd. And she took one look at them and she said, well, I don't know about this kind of stuff, she said, but I can tell you, as a psychologist, that whatever those girls tell you is happening, they believe is happening. And the reason for that is we've done, that, we've done studies in ecstasy for pre-adolescence, and they can't fake things. So they, they just, they're incapable. They don't have the nervous system or the psychological development or the brain neurological development to fake that kind of thing. So that's real. I'm not saying that, it, that it's due to Our Lady, but that's real. Well, if that's real, what is it due to? If it's not, so, you know, you have to have a, come up with a better explanation. And it's not obvious there is one. And so that set me looking at the other, the other apparitions, and then I became really very fond of Our Lady. And also, it helped greatly because praying the rosary turned out to be one of the most effective ways of saying one's prayers. Um, and that took me to the Eucharistic miracles. And so when I, when I discovered there was one in 1994, which is really quite recent, indeed, in the lifetime of some of you here, I notice, <laughs> I thought, well, let's look at it. And then, and then it's simply, it's beyond extraordinary. And in fact, the Jewish uh, lab, he wasn't a technician, he was a senior scientist in New York, who was a Jewish atheist, became a Catholic overnight when they'd proved to him where the tissue they'd given him to analyze came from. And then there were half a dozen more, one in Tixler in Mexico and several dotted round uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and it begins to get very exciting. And you probably know about the shroud. We were misinformed about the shroud. There was a fire uh, and, and there were attempt, many evil attempts to, to mend the shroud. And when I was young, growing up, they kept on saying, we've, we've bust the shroud. It's medieval. We've done tests on the fabric. And what they'd done, of course, is they, right, right knowingly or unknowingly, they'd taken a bit of the medieval mending and tested it and discovered it was medieval mending. Well, yes, that's right. But the rest of the shroud has seeds in it that come only from Palestine and cloth that is 2,000 years old. And then, then there's Guadalupe and that, that extraordinary relic there where, where you can see reflections in Our Lady's eyes. You can see the people who were looking at her. And nobody can explain how the material hasn't decayed or how the colors are or how it was made in the same way they can't explain how the image of the crucified man got onto the shroud. And so when we begin to say, well, we have the science to tell us that the level of authenticity of these things is really quite high, everything they say about themselves science can prove, would you like to reconsider your mindset, your prejudices, your, your presuppositions. And that's when you discover whether people are open-minded or when they're not. And usually, of course, they're not. Because, and I can tell you this as a convert, it takes a great deal to open your mind and to reorder your landscape internally, especially when it comes down to something like this. And I was, I was deeply propagandized. I, 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 I had ang what we call Anglo-Catholic leanings, and you might think this would make me sympathetic to the Anglo-Catholics, but I, I think the way I would describe Anglo-Catholics, for those of you who are sophisticated church watchers here, is as a form of sacramental nostalgia. I think that when the mass was banned and, and, and wiped out effectively from the life of the church, the people who were quite sincerely Christian and who said their prayers, I mean, genuinely, sacrificially Christian, who longed for something, and it turned out that the hole in their heart was mass-shaped. So they, they set out trying to reinvent it. Well, if we can reinvent the mass, would, would it be the mass? And, and I've been getting into trouble recently because, because some of my friends uh, want to ignore Apostolic I Curi, which is the great investigation that Pope Leo XIII launched in 1997. Um, and, and effectively, it's really quite interesting. Very, again, very few people have read it. So I did a YouTube the other day when I read it out. Um, and I had forgotten since my last reading of it 10 years ago that actually in 1701, they asked this question about Anglicans. Are Anglicans ordained to the priesthood? And they had, they had two problems. One is 
they were not entirely sure that the apostolic succession held in terms of tactile lineage. It's one element. But the other problem was that for a hundred years they changed their liturgy. And so when they use the word priest, they don't mean a priest. When they use the word bishop, they don't mean a bishop. When they, when they use the, uh, the notion of the communion service, they don't mean the sacrifice of the mass. They mean something much more like what third wave feminism thinks of when, it, when you want to discover what your gender is. Something in your head that you make up that becomes real because you care about it and invest yourself in it. And essentially, I've come to the conclusion that Anglican sacramentalism is a form of third wave feminism applied to the liturgy. So it's not a, a point of view that people like at all. But, but much worse than that, the, the trouble is that, that what Anglicanism was doing was it was replacing the mass with something designed to look, look enough like it to make people think they were getting it, but efficiently depriving anybody of the possibility of getting it. And I think that's evil. I don't mean to be rude, and I'm not being insulting, but I think theologically and metaphysically that's evil. It's a bit like taking somebody in to give them cancer treatment and giving them homeopathic stuff instead that doesn't work. That's not kind, that's not healing. Now, the Anglicans don't mean to be evil, and the Church of England isn't an evil organization, but what it set itself the task of doing was keeping the mass away from the people. But it was the mass that made England. A thousand years of the mass made this country what it was. If you take what you see at the back seriously, and if you take, for example, some of the documented miracles we have here that seriously, then the mass is the most enormous thing. I got a few clues as I was going along. Some were negative and some were positive. I remember a negative one. I only tell you this to make you laugh. I was in charge of music at... at, at Catholic Anglican version of, of seminary and my job was to teach my fellow would-be Anglican priests to sing and, and um, we were very Vatican II-ish in those days and we had all kinds of jingly jangly settings of the liturgy which I taught them to sing I even taught them to play the guitar I could teach you to play the guitar if you want <laughs> though I don't advise it for mass and um, uh, there's a big argument in Anglicanism you'll find this a bit esoteric I, I bet I've got to stop soon good lord I have I knew it um, I was beginning to get uncomfortable feelings. That means someone up there is saying, stop, stop, you're going over. We'll have questions in just a second. Uh, and uh, there's an esoteric debate in Anglicans because the Anglicanism is a, is a composite political mixture of four or five ecclesiastical organizations ranging across the Reformation. I don't have an interest in this now, but they're always at war with each other. They're three basic tribes, and they all think different things are at war. And one of the things they fight over is how close to the moment of prayer over the bread and wine, the Agnus Dei should be. Because the prots want it as far away as possible. And the nostalgic sacramentalists would like it quite close up. Obviously, you can see why. So I was at a very prot seminary. And one day, the, uh, the, the principal came up to me and thanked me for the jingly jangly thing I just taught people. We had just got to, uh, to be before the Agnus Dei. And he said, what are you doing next week? And I said, well, I'm doing the Agnus Dei. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, oh, I am, David. Really, it's comes next. No, he said, you're not. And I realized something was going on. I said, why, why am I not? Because, he said, and looking at me as though we were talking about pornography available in wrapped up prime paper bags, because, he said, some of the brethren might be misled into thinking there was a connection between the bread and the Lamb of God. I said to him, David, I don't want not to be ordained, but I always thought there was. <laughs> well, there isn't he said. So I said, David, if this is a matter of contention or misunderstanding, since you teach liturgical studies, perhaps you could make it your business in the liturgical lectures to let people know that there isn't. But meanwhile, I'd quite like to teach people to sing the Agnus Dei because it's an awfully pretty tune. This conversation is at an end, he said. Well, that just gives you an idea of quite how twitchy they are about the whole thing. And I'm, not, I'm saying this partly to amuse you, but partly to make a very serious point. They're desperately worried. They're frightened of the Mass. I remember when I was looking at the Lord's Prayer, there came a point when I was saying to the Lord and I prayed the Lord's Prayer, Lord, I think I've got this wrong. I don't, I, I, if you, the eternal Logos, was to come down here and, and give us the best prayer of all, I think you should have done better than the Lord's Prayer, frankly. I'm, I'm underwhelmed by it, I said to him. So I thought, this is a bit cheeky, I better go back and, and have a look at it again. So 
I went back and had a look at it again. And, and I, I, I was suddenly reminded of, of Hesychastic Hezik, Hezik, structure. Um, and um, chiastic structure, I'm so sorry. The chiasm, the cross. And essentially, all through the Bible, you have chiastic structures. And it goes sort of A, B, C, C, B, A. And that's the Lord's Prayer. So effectively, the one of the ways you could pray it would be, according to this chiastic structure, our Father who art in heaven, deliver us from the evil one. Hallowed be thy name, and lead us not into temptation. Your kingdom come, which by the way is forgive me my sins as I forgive all the others. And then the climax, the middle line, it's always the climax. And give us this day our, well, what is it? Now, St. Jerome made a mistake. I don't hate to be rude to him, but, he had, but, but when he put this into Latin, he put panem quotidianum, which is daily bread, which is snack, lunch, leavens is, whatever you want it to be. That's what most of us mean when we say give us today our daily bread. Don't let me go hungry like the Biafrans, Lord. But that's not what it is in Greek at all. It's, it's arton epiusion. It's the bread of... Now, the word epiusion doesn't exist anywhere. So it was made up by the gospel writers to try and give an, to try and give an impression of what our Lord meant. So that the, the heart of the word is ousios, which is being. And if you know about the homoousion and, and the, the, the creedal controversy, it, it's the being of God. Jesus shares the same ousios as the Father. So we share... Um, not to say we're in the image of God, but, but ousion is, is the great Greek word for, the, for being, and epi is, is everywhere, everything. It's, it's, so the best example is a super substantial bread. The epiousion, the bread for everything to do with being. Oh, that's the Eucharist. That's mass. That's not snack. It's not panem quotidianum, which is what St. Jerome fed us with. Well, suddenly what the Catholics have been saying about the relationship between the Mass and Jesus, the Bread of Life, and those chapters 5 to 8 of St. John's Gospel, it's there in the Lord's Prayer too. It makes sense. And so I began to change my mind. And, and as I said, the Eucharistic miracles were the things that tipped me over the edge when I discovered that science was on the side of faith. So let me finish by saying this is such an exciting moment because we've all been brainwashed into thinking that science is against faith. They'll keep on telling you that it started with Galileo or something. See, you know that why Galileo was put in prison, don't you? It didn't really have much to do with the sun. It was because he and the Pope fell out, and he cheeked the Pope, and the Pope put him under house arrest. Because most of the Catholics, well, first of all, the astronomers are all Catholics. And, and most of them were perfectly well aware that they, they were beginning to have to change their understanding of the cosmos. This was not a huge thing. And so the, the atheists and the scientists will tell us that Galileo suffered dreadfully for his faith, that, Actually, he was put into hunt under house arrest mainly for cheeking the Pope, who couldn't forgive him for, for, who used to be a friend of his. But the fact is that science and theology are never at odds with each other, because to put it very oversimplistically, science is all about how. And, and although it does verge into the why questions in quantum mechanics, which I'm not clever enough to understand, and theology is all about, well, it's all about why. And they need each other. And there are moments when not only do they need each other, but where they serve each other. And, and that's why there was a scientific revolution under Christianity, because the vision of God, the picture of God we have, is one which allows us to open the universe and to understand it, because it's not capricious, it's logical, it delivers, it's good, it's sane. All the things that come from the mind of the Creator. And as it happens, there are moments when science can tell us that the Catholics are right. There's a miracle every Mass. And that's why, although I told myself I'd try and be nice to Anglicanism retrospectively because it would look polite, I just want to say to the Anglicans, you're fooling yourselves. You're taking up space with something homeopathic. You really want Jesus in the Mass. Come and get him. Come and be a Catholic. Thank you very much. We'll take some questions. When, now, this will be the most interesting bit. We're not quite sure how to do this, but my, I thought we'd start off with inviting you to stand up and shout. <laughs> because, first of all, it's exciting. And, and secondly, it doesn't require any technology to go wrong. If, however, you're too shy or the acoustics don't work, we can produce a microphone. So let's, let's try. If you have any heckling to do, do it now or forever hold your peace. Do you have to hold your hand up? If not, we can all go to the pub, which is also equally good. I've got somebody who's promised me a drink. Yes, at the back. Hi. Can you shout because you're being recorded? And What's your opinion of Hilaire's Bell? 
I, oh, gosh, well, see, I'm rereading everything. Do, do you know about his journey from, from New York to California to, to try and get his girlfriend? He walked right the way across America because he was in love with this slightly neurotic girlfriend who wanted to be a nun. Um, I, I, just, I just love him. I mean, I'm so fond of Chester Belloc. Uh, I'm, I'm rereading all of Chesterton, I'm rereading Hilaire Belloc, and uh, I'm trying to persuade my friends on the Catholic Herald that, that since they both wrote for the Herald, uh, some of us did, that we should, we should really you know, major on their strengths because they were both extraordinary people. And, and they've even got important things, I think, to say economically and politically with their notions of distributism. Um, but they were, they were the most wonderful intellectually nonconformist Catholic voices. They're, utter treasures, any, any culture, any language would be ecstatically proud to have them and we're not making enough of them. Someone's offered to buy me a drink. I'm very happy to go. If you don't. Yes, hello, yes. Come and shout, yes. Oh, you're a gold member. <laughs> oh, bravo. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 indeed. The Archbishop of Canterbury's son. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. I mean, people assume it's a, it's a sort of delayed adolescence in me, um, and uh, and it might be, but I don't think it is. I think uh, you, know, you know sometimes one gets familiarity breeds I don't know all kinds of things. But um, see, the nice thing about going to mass, you see, if you're an Anglican or a Protestant, the vicar has to entertain you. He's got to stand up and welcome you and tell you why you need to come to this church. And he's got to be good at at least seven things. And people then like him or they don't like him. And it's immediately kind of schismatic and like a circus. When you go to Mass, it doesn't matter about the priest. <laughs> it's a relief. He doesn't have to seduce you. He doesn't have to persuade you. He just brings you Jesus. Because it's a matter of authority. And it's such a relief. It's just, I mean, I love the way my parish priest doesn't preach. I just, he was, he once, he was a hotel manager once, and every Sunday he tells us a little bit about the hotel trade and something about the Gospels, and it's absolutely charming, and, and I'm so fond of him. And then we get on to the Mass, which is what I've come for. And, um, I mean, if he, you know, he occasionally tells me things I need to remember in the Gospels, and I'm very grateful. But, it, but it's, it's, it's such a relief. It just, it happens to you. You don't earn it. You don't produce it. You don't make it. The church happens despite us. It's really such a relief. It's absolution trickling down out of the confessional and through everything. So can I just say that gold members, you may wonder why I was so excited. So uh, my, my, small, my group, which I'm very proud of and love deeply, called Catholic Unscripted, the three of us, we've taken to YouTube. And essentially, we're simply trying to, to explain the Catholic faith to people. And the fact is that every week people become Catholics, and it's very exciting. However, it requires financing. So since one of us is a teacher, she very cleverly designed 
gold, bronze, silver, and gold membership. And I have to tell you, you get different things for each of these things. And if you want to know what you get, gold is really quite something. Then, then please look up catholicunscripted.com.org or .uk or something and become a gold member. Or if you can't afford it, a silver member, uh, which I think costs the same as a cup of coffee a month. Anyway, we'd be very grateful. Thank you so much because, because it's, it's an apostolate that God is blessing despite us and we're very grateful. Yes? Yes. Well, the, the church teaches that you need to go to confession and, and present yourself at the Eucharist, confess and absolve, and that's exactly right. Yes. So, I, that's, I mean, so when you see it, you're so sweet when you say, do I have any views? I don't have views. That's a catechism. <laughs> the catechism has views. And this is, it's, 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 when people say, you know, who do you think you are? You know the whole of Catholicism after being a Catholic for five minutes. I say, oh, I know nothing. I just look it up in the catechism, and there it is. I love it. And it explains the fathers and the patristics and the history. And for people, you know, I mean, when I discovered that St. Thomas Aquinas had written a commentary on all the Gospels, I just can't tell you. Why did nobody tell me this? I'd have borrowed this stuff, stolen from it years ago. It's all there. So just read the catechism. My views are of no importance whatsoever. I just try and conform myself to the Catholic Church, which is, you know, which is hard enough, but that's, that's the task. Yes? Oh dear, a hypothetical question. This is always very dangerous. Go on. What, what am I to suppose? Very skeptical Yes. Which of the Eucharistic miracles would you present as having the most scientific depth so that it would completely convince? Yes. Well, well for, first of all, you, 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 I mean, if I may, when you present us with the hypothetical skeptical atheist, you, you do it with a kind of tone of veiled threat, which is understandably, because, no, 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 I'm just saying, it, it, I'm not blaming you of anything, I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, these atheists, they're, they're tough. They're our best friends. They're absolutely our best friends because they ask the questions for us. You cannot come to Jesus without being provoked to ask questions. I can't read any of the Gospels without being overwhelmed by questions. Still, I've been reading them for 45 years. Sometimes I even try and read them in Greek. Every time I come away with more questions. Every time they open me up, they stretch me, they turn me upside down. And, and, and you know, then there's this kind of alchemy of the Holy Spirit who does something. Uh, it, to, to be a Christian is to live the life of an extraordinary adventurer, an adventurer of the heart and of the mind and, 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 and a pilgrim. So to the atheist, I would say, well, I'd just say, look at Buenos Aires, 94. It's, you know, John, um, uh, Henry, no, Tess, 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 what's his name? Quick, quick, quick. Wait a moment. The, uh, he's a friend of mine. God, I hope he doesn't listen to this conversation. Teslo, Tess, Tess. Well, the man who's publicized them anyway. He's <laughs> and written the book. Um, the, 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 the evidence is that you know, it, it was only done 25, 30 years ago um, and, and it's, it's all done in the laboratory and then there are four or five or six others where the laboratory tests were the same and they always come up with the same result. Blood group A, B, living heart tissue, where did you get this? And not from the grave, always from the mass. I mean, it's... it's I mean, I'm, so, I'm a bit naive. I mean, I'm, I'm not scientifically literate. I've tried to be. I really have tried and failed completely. But I, but I, you know, I can read scientific results. I'm just blown away that science tells us, unless people are tricking, of course, but then you'd have to say, why would you? And where would you get it? And how would you do it? I mean, the whole point about these, these, these um, tests is that this, these, this tissue is of recent human origin. So... How on earth do you do that if you're... And why would you bother? For, you know, I, mean, I mean, who could be bothered, for goodness sake? I mean, the, the tests prove it already, and it's still not really having much an effect, except that Carlo Aquitas thinks it ought to, and so do I, and so do probably you, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight. And, you know, if Catholics went round saying the Mass is the Mass and we can prove it to, to scientific empirical rationalists, it's very exciting. Suddenly a whole load of... The conversation takes a whole different shift... And so, I mean, nobody has to believe, but I think one of the things you say to the people is, do you have a better explanation? Because I'd like to hear it. I'm, I'm going with a course of least strain. You know, the whole thing just matches up with congruity. I quite like that. You know, in my head, I can sleep at night. How do you sleep at night, you say to the atheist? 
I mean, how, you know, I, I, never, I can't even conceive of how one can be an atheist because, because the whole world is so riddled with meaning and, and, and consistency and generation that, I mean, you know, it's a, how does this happen by accident or by, by chaos? It's a bit like the moment you put a bit of ink, a drop of ink in a bowl of water, the whole of the water is, irradi is irradiated immediately. The moment you put meaning into the universe, even if it's just this globe, the whole of the universe now contains meaning. It always did before, before the ending happened on this earth when you, when you look at it. Hello, yes, time, time to stop, I'm so sorry. Right. Yeah, my train, good Lord. Absolutely, my train, thank you very much. Well, um, one last question, yes. Yes. Right. Yes. You were photographing? I was photographing uh, looking at the, through the camera, which was the vessel that had the blood in. Yes. So we're in Lanciano taking a photograph of the vessel that has a blood in. And? Yes. It throbbed. Like a heart. And is it on camera? Yes. Yes. Well, that's what I mean about, about the life as a Christian being the most extraordinary journey of constant discovery and affirmation. And it even involves cameras and pulsing Eucharists at Lanciano. You've been very patient. Thank you so much. If you want to, I, I, I've got to catch a train at, at just after nine, but I'm, I'll be hanging around, and so I'm sure we can talk. Thank you so much for coming. Most importantly, ask your parish priest to get hold of this exhibition and then find somebody who can come and make sense of it for you and you've, you've heard it you've heard it done as an amateur get a pro in thank you very much i can only say a very very big thank you to gavin for coming to speak to us tonight and to really enthusing at us uh, I'm sure our heads are spinning, but it's opening up a realization which personally I feel has been so sadly forgotten amongst Catholics. So it's wonderful. And Carlo has made me think in so much as well. I'm so delighted I've, I, I've sort of come to know him. And I read about him from his mother's book, and it's astonishing, his life. So on that point, one thing he was, he was very, very normal, and he loved chocolate. And uh, he loved chocolate cake particularly. Now, I know your, I say your heads are spinning. In the hall, there are tea and coffees and things like that where you can simmer down. And I think there's a lot of Carlo cake there as well, which they would like you to finish off for them. So um, thank you again, Gavin. Wonderful to have you. And uh, please come again at some thank stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very I'd much. love to. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, again, it's often the Anglicans that remind us of the, the sweetness and the greatness of our faith. And um, today we celebrate one of the English martyrs, martyred 400 years ago. And when presented with being hung, drawn and quartered, he said, this suffering that you are about to inflict on me is just a flea bite compared to the great suffering my saviour suffered for me, um, that my sweet saviour suffered for me on the cross. And let us remember at the Mass is the suffering of Christ, uh, who did it out of love for us. And there's nothing sweeter than the Mass. Uh, and so we should even endure hung, drawn, and quartered. Uh, we should even endure ask, answering a few questions from our atheist friends or, uh, or others that deny the sacrifice of the Mass from our other uh, Christian denominations. So thank you for reminding us of the great treasure that all those martyrs died for. And may our lives um, lead ever grow greater, uh, ever closer to the sacred heart of Jesus uh, that burns for us, that was pierced for us and is given to us in the Eucharist. And reminding ourselves that Our Lady brought us uh, the Eucharist, brought us Christ, helped Dr. Gavin Ashton come to Christ in the Eucharist. Let us just 
Say together three Hail Marys and a glory be. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Do go and have some coffee, please. There's plenty in there. And Gavin's going to have a quick coffee as well. And uh, if you're lucky, you might get a word, but otherwise, I'm going to whip him down to the station very quickly. <laughs> yes. They're not bad, are they? Well, it works well. It does work three well. are super. Thank you. Just two, I love your suit to three. Thank you very much. And that is Dorsey. Yes. My thing is that we need to do a sermon on the gospel or on whatever it means. I think sometimes, yes, I mean, well, some, sometimes because when we read the gospel out, 